Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Uh, once again, we are blessed to be in each other's company. Uh, to have some sort of interaction or discussion with regards to the holy month of Muharram. Something that came to my mind, and uh, I've been asked this, maybe you've been asked this yourself, is we are told about the way in which Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he leaves from Medina and enters into Mecca, then as we know, he changes from Hajj into Umrah Mufrada and goes towards Kufa. Uh, he is aware throughout the journey. We find the sons of the Imam and companions telling us that the Imam would mention throughout this journey about death and about martyrdom. And he would mention the story of Yahya alayhi salam, who as we know was also martyred in the way that Imam Hussein alayhi salam was. So he was aware of his death. He was aware of the way he will die. He was aware of the people that will die. He was aware of the place where he will be buried. That's why we are told when he enters into Karbala, he knows that this is the place that he will, uh, is his resting place. So the question that comes is that this is one of the many indicators that we have from the lives of all of the Imam alayhi salam that our Imams have knowledge of the unseen. The ilm and knowledge of that which is not present, that which is ghayb. And they have knowledge of the past and the present and the future. Or for example, we have the very famous narrations of after the death of the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, that uh, Az-Zahra alayhi salam would have the Mus'haf where Jibra'il would come down and he would mention all of the information that will take place, all knowledge until the day of Qiyamah that will take place. He would tell her all of these things. She would then narrate it to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam who would write it and it would form the book Mus'haf of Az-Zahra alayhi salam. So the first question that I wish to discuss, there are many issues that inshallah we can come, can come out from here with regards to knowledge of the unseen of the Imma alayhi salam is what do we mean by knowledge? Someone may ask you, someone may ask me, what do we mean by knowledge in the first place? So that we can then link it with what is this knowledge of ghayb. So how can we understand ilm? Is there a way to define it? Can we define it? Maybe we, maybe we don't know how to define it. Well, this whole um, topic of knowledge and of course of the unseen has always been interesting to me. I think um, mainly because I haven't fully grasped the idea mm. and what it actually means. Um, and I'm more of a, in a state of query than actually explaining what I think it is. Mm. Um, of course, there's different types of knowledge out there, you know, um, detailed, undetailed. And that's what I really would like to know. Um, a, how this knowledge is transferred, and you've actually highlighted that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but most importantly, the second part of my question is, how uh, uh, is it high level? For example, so uh, the Imam is made aware that you will be slain in the land of Karbala, and uh, your women folk will be there with you. Afterwards, they'll be paraded down Kufa and Sham. Sham yeah. High level stuff. Or is it more of a, a deep dive exercise where systematically, <coughs> Step by step, uh, the Imam was um, made aware e either by his, his father. Gradually. Uh, yeah. Um, extreme detail that we know. For example, you will be uh, murdered in this way by this individual. This is going to be the murder weapon. Your sister Zainab is going to be a few steps away observing and thanking of Allah for accepting this esteemed sacrifice. Hmm. You know, that type of stuff. I, I just can't get my head around to it. How much did the Imam know? You know, sorry to say. Um, uh, on the way to Karbala, mm. uh, Imam Hussein he stopped actually at one point, and he gave a very famous sermon that mm -hmm. in which he gave. And part of the sermon was, "Kani bi awsali." It's as if uh, I see my body being cut into pieces by the wolves of the desert between Nawawis and Karbala, which is literally the exact place in which um, he was uh, slaughtered in. And of course, then when we look at uh, what he meant, of course, with the wolves of the desert, he didn't literally mean the wolves of the desert, but this army of Yazid, he referred to as the wolves. He actually described his um, the way he was going to get killed. So, uh, oh, that makes sense to us, and we know that he has knowledge of the unseen. You o you asked to define asked knowledge. Define knowledge. Okay, I can give you a definition from the Oxford Dictionary. Okay, give it to me. <laughs> no, because I think this will be important. Yeah, see, see, see. It's a valuable, yeah, contribution. So it says facts, information, and skills acquired through experience or education, the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject, awareness or familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. So it's 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 knowing something or learning some 
some sort of skill uh, through experience or education. That's how... This definition is not a complete definition. I'm sure not, but this is how they define it. So what would you say on Let's top of say that? Let's say right now, yep. I took a pin mm. and I pricked it yep. on your hand. Okay, please don't. No, <laughs> let's say I did. Sure. Is that knowledge in a form for yep. you? So it's, it's, it's learning something through experience. My experience through that taught me that this hurts. So that pain is knowledge. Yep. That the sense of pain mm -hmm. that you feel when someone, for example, touches you or whatever, yeah. is knowledge. Yes. This said facts and information. We are told knowledge is actually a surah al muntaba fi A so picture yeah. which has been imprinted. imprinted and impressed onto my mind. So when I have a picture which is stored in my mind, this is called knowledge. So for example, right now I said human being. A rough kind of picture of a human being is in your mind. You have knowledge of what a human being is. I said a house. A picture of a house comes into your mind. Knowledge is actually pictures. Cool. Two types of knowledge generally exist. One is the type that I just explained to you now. Someone pinches you, you have knowledge of that pain. Did brother Ibrahim have to tell you that you have pain? Did he tell you, by the way, you ha you're feeling pain at the moment? No, you feel that directly without any intermediary. It's not and it's not a taught It's thing. not taught. It's something that's natural. Comes directly. Mm -hmm. The second, this is called huduri. The second is no. You wanted to know a certain thing. What time is it? You want to know, knowledge of the time. You ask. You ask, Brother Ibrahim told you the time is whatever it may be. So that has come through a means. So there's two types of knowledge. One which comes without any intermediary. The second is that which comes through an intermediary. Oh. Allah's knowledge, is it huduri or husuli? Is it that which comes through an intermediary or that which comes directly? And think about this properly. But the way that you describe knowledge is like you describe knowledge uh, when speaking of a computer, not mm -hmm. when speaking of a human being, I think. In what way? I mean, so how, did, how does a human being differ? I mean, it, it, it's an image imprinted on... In, into your brain, I think it's a bit more than just that. No, the way in which I gain knowledge is different. Yeah. I have sense, my five senses. Man faqada hissan, faqada ilma. Famous statement, whoever loses one of his five senses, loses ilm. Yes. Mm. If I can't see, I have lost a lot of so knowledge. It's a way of processing the information. Or At the knowledge. end of the day, it comes down to this. I ask you then, is Allah's knowledge through an intermediary or is it Huduri, uh, without any intermediary, what would you say? Of course Allah doesn't need someone to yeah. tell him. So for example, use the example of the time. So if Sayyid Ali would, would need to know the time, he would ask someone else and, cool. and they would, he would tell him of the time. However, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't need someone to give him the knowledge. He, he is knowledge. Mm. So is it, is it any of those two? I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm, no, is, it, is it Allah or is it our belief in Allah? No, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's okay. knowledge himself that he has. Oh, not complete he, knowledge. Okay, he, okay. he himself is the knowledge, as in it's part of his attributes, isn't it? And his so, attributes according to, um, to our aqeedah are, are, are not separate parts from huh. him. So this discussion of knowledge comes through an intermediary or comes directly, comes when first there's no knowledge. Then when I want to gain knowledge, either it comes directly or it comes through a means. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was never a time when there's no knowledge. So there's not this discussion at all. For us, we have it. Sometimes I study and I go to a teacher and I gain knowledge. Sometimes I have knowledge of certain things directly. I'm thirsty. This is knowledge. Knowledge of me being thirsty. No one told me you're thirsty. I had this directly. It's a feeling you get. Exactly. When it comes to the prophets and a'imma alayhim salam we are told they have knowledge. This knowledge of the unseen that they would have is different to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. How? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge hasn't been given by anyone as we said. Their knowledge has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, they didn't have a teacher. There wasn't any husul. It wasn't that the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa had to go and study from uh, X, Y, Z in Mecca or Medina as some people try and, try and make out. No, this was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difference between their knowledge and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, example that someone gives, is that someone has a banquet or a feast and people come to eat. The difference between me eating and you eating is that when I eat, this food is my own. 
when you eat, you're eating from my food. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's his own knowledge. No one has given it to him. When others were given knowledge, we can't say, oh. And I actually had a few people said, say this to me a few months ago when I had gone to a place to lecture. And they said, people, speakers, and khutaba and ulama, they make uh, the a'imma and prophets like God. They say they have perfect knowledge. We didn't say that they have the same knowledge as God. We said that they have knowledge of the unseen. And the clear difference between their knowledge and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is that their knowledge is given. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, as you said, is part of the essence. When it comes to the Imams and Anbiya, we are told that they have knowledge of what took place in the past, what is happening now, what will happen. Why is this a necessity? Why do we need to have them having this perfect knowledge of this world? Is this a necessity or not? You know, sometimes um, this, this example in Surah Al-Imran, mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, when it's talking about uh, Nabi Allah Isa, he says, Then it comes and it says, I know what you ate and what you have inside your houses. May this be like a sign for those who, who want to believe. So sometimes it's used as, as a sign. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them some knowledge of the unseen. So like the so miracle? Like miracles. So maybe we can say one of the miracles of a certain prophet could be his knowledge of the unseen. Yeah. Okay. But we need them to have this knowledge because... Without it, how are we going to have any knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Our sinful souls cannot sometimes directly get the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, right now in the air or in that or wherever you call it, there's internet. Mm -hmm. I can't connect to this internet unless I have a password or a router or something. Mm -hmm. That way I can connect to the internet. So sometimes to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we don't, we're not infallibles, we need them to give us that kind of that knowledge. That is knowledge of sharia. Knowledge of sharia we put to the side. We accept that they have complete, a pre, a knowledge of Islam, let's say, of what is going to be brought down. Okay. Do they also need to have perfect knowledge about what I do? Do they need to have perfect knowledge about when I will die? How I earn my rizq, what the time is that they will pass away. We're not talking about that perfect knowledge of sharia and aqeedah and Probably then, the how would they do intercession for us? Of course, they need to have that so they'll be able to know how to best serve the community that they are sent down to. Yeah. In order for them mm -hmm. to, to, to tailor their message, uh, to, for it to be the most perfect relevant. message, relevant, uh, efficient as well, you know, not to waste any of, any, mm -hmm. any of their efforts and time. So they do need to have um, knowledge of, uh, of the past and of the present, present and the future. And the future. So when Imam Ali, during, I forgot which battle, but when he used to fight and kill, he, he was able to see down their lineage, or sorry, their generations, yeah. mm. to see who, if there's a moment that was going to be brought up or who was going to, they were going to give birth. So that's deep. I mean, that's some knowledge. <laughs> so as said, Amir said, when they have that knowledge, they can then, uh, direct the message in the correct way. Yes. Yes. Quran says, we believe of course that they have perfect knowledge of what's going on. Yes. Why? Because if you have imperfect knowledge, this is a naqs. This is, this is a defect. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. There's an interesting principle in aqaid, in beliefs and theology, and it's also used in some areas of fiqh, called the principle of lutf. <laughs> Or grace. We don't need to go into the details, but just a very simple example. All of us, let's say, came to a classroom to study with a teacher. The purpose of us coming here is what? To study. Mm. Fiqh. Jurisprudence. We entered in. There's two things that could happen. One is that the classroom has beautiful light. There are chairs there. There's refreshments at the back for when I get tired. The teacher is sitting. He has a whiteboard. Every person has their own uh, exercise book and textbook on the table, ready. This is one way to study. The other way I entered in, the lights don't work. There's no chairs. There's no tables. There's no board. It's very cold. There's no heating. The teacher is sitting on the floor. A substitute teacher. Water, <laughs> water is dripping from the roof. In both cases, I'm going to study. In both cases, I'll do the dars, I'll do the lesson. However, if there is a person who has mercy and justice, 
he will want to maximize the efficiency of why I have come to that place. So I have come there for dars, for a lesson. In the first case, I'll be more easily able to study that lesson than in the second case. Therefore, it makes more sense to someone who is completely just and has complete mercy to make the best arrangements for that purpose so that there are no barriers for me to gaining that knowledge. In the same way, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was a purpose that I obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some ask the question, we have this in our aqeedah, that an imam or an infallible cannot have any physical defect. Why? Not because this causes where discrimination and this, no. If there was a physical defect, this may cause a barrier between one or two people accepting the message of that imam. If they didn't have complete knowledge in all areas to do with my life, this may act like in the way that when the teacher, there's no table, one person, one student, maybe he doesn't want to study. There's no refreshments, one student, he can't gain the same amount. However, when all of the things are placed, there's no barriers for me to reach that goal. In the same way we were given these infallibles, Allah didn't place any barriers. He gave them perfect knowledge. He didn't make them dependent on any other person or teacher. This is what we accept. If we accept them that they have this perfect knowledge, I ask you that the Quran says, قُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي ilma." The Prophet of Islam said, Ya Allah, increase in my knowledge. Increasing of knowledge takes place when there is a gap in my knowledge. So do we accept that there's a gap in the knowledge of the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? And in that case, someone could come and say, it doesn't necessarily mean that he needs to know when he's going to die, or how he's going to die, or where he's going to be buried. Because the Quran says what? Rabbi zidni ilma. Increase in my knowledge, unless I don't have the knowledge. How can we answer this? Is there a way to answer it? For example, we always say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa arfa' darajatu. So the Prophet at the age of 60 was not the same as the Prophet at the age of six months and the prophet today is not the same as the prophet before so o you can always gain more closeness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the best way to do that obviously is the more ma'rifah you know of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so here knowledge is not what type of knowledge you have put exactly the right thing yeah so knowledge here is meant to be what uh not knowledge of 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 like science. mathematics no no, no no but knowledge of ma'rifah why because we have different types of knowledge one is knowledge of what's happening now, what took place, and what's going to happen in the future. The hadith says, when, as this is the answer to your question, when they want to know, they know. I want to know, for example, where this brother lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, yes. Allah gives me this knowledge. I want to know when my son, Ali al Akbar, in which place in Karbala, where will he die? Will he die in this spot or that spot or that spot? I'm told that knowledge. The second type of knowledge is knowledge of the world, mathematics and geography and whatever. They were given that perfectly. And we have all of these statements of Amir al Mu'mineen, but we've seen in Nahj al Balagha, for example, you've all read these things about their perfect knowledge. The third type of knowledge is knowledge of Allah. As Allah is unlimited, knowledge of Allah is unlimited. Therefore, no matter how much knowledge of Allah I gain, it can always be increased. And that is what you said. That's why they said, Rabbi Zinni Alma. So this doesn't go against knowledge of the uh, unseen of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, in the, when he first enters into Karbala, we know this, that he takes the companions, or there's one companion in particular, and he shows him, this is where my children will be killed. This is where this will happen. This is where that will happen. This is where I'll fall. So he knows about all of this information from beforehand. Can I just say that this knowledge comes from closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even there are riwayat that say the Ashab of Imam Al-Hussein uh, like a veil was removed from in front of their eyes mm. uh, on, the day, on the night of Ashura, on the day of Ashura where they can see the heavens. They all could only reach this knowledge because they're reaching such closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's the riwayat that says, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm. I don't want to state a riwayat in the wrong way but uh, Abdi Atani. فتكون مثلي أو مثلي أو مثلي تقول تقول لشيء كن فيكون. so the more closeness you seek to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the closer you get to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the more what I would like to call true knowledge you gain. 
Yeah, as they say, knowledge is not just gained from studying a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Certain people you have seen that they study don't they study that much. I am I am getting exactly how you're putting this forward. Um, Divine so, knowledge. Divine knowledge. I so you're saying that if an imam wanted a particular type of knowledge, he would, in a way, ask for it, and it would come directly to him at that moment in time. If there is a certain thing that Allah, they don't know a certain thing at that time, but they want to know it. Okay. They they are told about what that thing. Is. Okay, so. But with regards to shari and all things, that knowledge is perfect. Sure. From the beginning. Sure, sure. I understand. I understand. So. Um, on this topic, uh, so Imam Hussein enters Karbala. Yeah. Well, we've been told many occasions by various people from the pulpit, like mm. yourselves, because um, they all narrate the same event, it's just in their own style. Um, so obviously when we've been told that the trusty steed of the Imam reaches the plains of Karbala, its hooves are planted firmly and it doesn't budge anymore, with prompting the Imam to ask around, yeah. what, what is, is this place? So yeah. he gets the local tribesmen and all the you know Banu local Hasid, people. Yeah. But Banu Hasid. And so someone says, Nanawa. Is that yeah? One of them. And then someone obviously calls it out and says this is Karbala. Um, so at that point you're saying that Imam didn't necessarily know, or was that another hikmat, or is that something that he wanted everybody to go, something's about to happen now, something's going on. I mean, we don't know the, the vast knowledge in, that in certain cases we know that the uh, the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa for example, when he goes on Mi'raj. Says Jibrail, what is this? What is that? Oh, Prophet of Islam is Prophet of Islam, the best of creation. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. If he didn't ask Jibrail, what is this? We don't have a hadith <laughs> that tells us <laughs> what took place. It's, it's for information. It's for everyone else. He's not asking for himself. But sure, for everyone else. Sure. How do I? How do I know if I? Sure. If he doesn't ask. Right, right. I thought so. How I do I? That might but be otherwise, we, of course, we know that he's aware. And he says, this is the place that I have been promised by my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. And I'll be buried here. And I can see, the, for example, the visitors that would come to this place. The same thing is with Amir al-Mu'mineen. He tells Kumail, for example, that this is where you'll be buried. And this will be a city and there'll be Zawar and the whole thing. So there are many examples where we are told of this uh, knowledge of that which is in the future. Does it then make sense? And we discussed this, I think, in our last session, but we can also expand on it. Does it then make sense? For him when he knows that by going to this place I'll be killed, that he goes there anyway. You know, this was answered by Imam Hussein himself actually in Medina. He was uh, by the grave of Rasulullah and he was asked, so you're going, you know you're going to get killed, you're taking your family with you, you know that they're going to be cap uh, captures, why, why would you put them in this situation? And he answered, Allah and Yarani Qatilan wa Yarahunna Sabaya, Allah has willed to see me uh, martyred and to see them uh, as captures. So Imam Hussein actually answered this himself and of course so this is the will of Allah to be in this case and of course like we mentioned in our last session, mm -hmm. you mentioned this uh, yourself and the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we may not actually know. And then I think Sayyid Amir uh, actually uh, expanded on that to say many people can now relate to Karbala whether it's the ill or whether it's the the woman or whether it's so Same. of course the hikmah plus the world has to go in a natural has to continue in the natural way that we yeah. said it has to continue and Imam Hussein not once but many times stood and said by the way I have to alqil hujjah on you people I am the grandson of Rasulullah so he gave them the opportunity he gave them the chance it didn't happen things have to with regards to continue. what you have said alhamdulillah is knowledge and you said this before even in Quran ya Yahya Take the book and scripture with power. What does power mean? With ilm. Mm. One of the words for knowledge is power. The more knowledge I gain, knowledge has a type of weight. You'll notice a person when he uh, is gaining knowledge, you see him one year after he's been, he, he seems different. Yes. His actions are different. It has a type of wazen, it has a type of weight, and it has a type of responsibility. The more the knowledge increases, the more responsibility increases, the more I see of the realities. And only that person is given the vast amount of knowledge when he is able to bear the realities. That's why the Ahlul Bayt, for example, Amir Mu'mineen has Amruna Sa'bun Mustas'ab. No one can bear our, our knowledge. 
Ibrahim in the Quran, Ibrahim Imama, after he went through tribulations, he was able to reach such able a to hold that burden and that level. And that level. So there are certain things that we are told they have this perfect knowledge, but they have to control that. And otherwise, I know that I'm going to be killed here. But when I have that, Allah, Allah has given me that knowledge, I have to keep it with me. And I can't say, because I know, that's why I'm going to go the opposite direction. <laughs> that's why I'm not going to leave my house today, because I know I'm going to be uh, struck in Masjid Kufa. That knowledge has a certain responsibility. But it comes with power. certain conditions. Which is, why everyone an unconditional isn't, uh, yeah, type of which is why everyone isn't given that knowledge. Mm. Certain people become marajit. When maybe his classmate was studying more than him, but he didn't have the tahammul, he wasn't able to hold that, that knowledge. You know, um, uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali Abdul Salatu Wasalam, he used to give some of his companions al manaya mm. the knowledge of, uh, of tragedies, uh, and one of them being Maytham al-Tamar. Mm. Uh, so he actually stood in, in the uh, castle of uh, Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, I believe. And he said to him, you're going to, uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen has told me that this will happen to me and I will be uh, hang on the palm tree, on my palm tree. And then he said, just because you said that, it won't happen, don't hang him on that palm tree. So they took him after and somehow, I don't know, some, some occasion occurred and uh, the person who was uh, actually taking him to, uh, to kill him was forced to actually hang him on this palm tree because of, I can't remember the exact story. But because of what happened, so at the end of the day, this alam of manai, this alam of tragedies, even though someone might try to change it, just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it in place, there's no way to change that it. That reminds all. me of uh, the story of Abu Lahab. The ayah came down and it said everything that is said. Yeah. Abu Lahab, <laughs> if he wanted to prove the Prophet and actually finish the whole religion, he could have just stopped doing what he was doing mm. and would have proved that the Quran was not real. Well, he did exactly what the Prophet said he would do, exactly what the Quran said he would do. And thus we have what we have today. So as we have seen from these examples, if the students of Ahlul Bayt can be given knowledge of their death and unseen, if I don't have knowledge, I can't give knowledge. When Ahlul Bayt can give that knowledge of, a type of knowledge of unseen to their students and companions, what is their knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them? And that's why we remember, especially on this night, where people say Imam Hussein is traveling and enters towards Karbala. You mentioned as well, uh, when they enter into that place, some rawayat say that the horse is no longer moving and he calls the tribe of Banu Asad. What is the name of this place? Shatul Farat. He said, does it have another name? Nainawa. Does it have another name? Taf. Does it have another name? Ghadriyat. Does it have another name? Until he's looking until they say one elderly man was brought out from the camp and he said, Sayyidi, this is called Karban wa Bala. And then he says, this is the place that I am to stay. In fact, the narrations also say, Imam Hussein says, I wish to buy this piece of land from you. Yes. Why? Because I wish that when people come to visit me, they are not your guests. They are the guests of Hussein alayhi salam. With regards to this munasabah, it would be good if we can hear some lines of poetry uh, remembering our great master Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Ajarakumullah when Imam Hussein reached the plains of Karbala it's as if he was asking the ground of Karbala the poet describes him saying وجه سؤال حسين لرض الغاضرية. Of course, if we could all contribute by by doing a one, إن شاء الله. وجه سؤال حسين لرض الغاضرية. أردني شدك كربلاء ردي عليا. جبريل من نشرفاع تربة وطيب هيفوح جدي تلقاها وعليه هالدمع مسفوح قلب هالوايا ادي روح حسين مذبوح 
this is describing this is describing Hussein saying to the plains of Karbala I want to ask you please answer me this isn't this the place where where Jibreel would take the sand and would tell Rasulullah that over here my blood will spoil